thanks everyone very much indeed for joining today. Um, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners and custodians of the land where I'm based right now, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and also making the point that I've been a beneficiary and, and have had the pleasure and, and uh, honour really of working on multiple different First Nations lands across Australia, ranging from Camaragal land across the harbour, um, well, the Madigal land where I live up the river in Parramatta, uh, but also in other places such as the Noongar Nation in Perth, uh, Nunawal Nation in Canberra as well now. So I think very much groundedness in country and paying respect to that is at the centre of the work that I do um, as a public health physician who focuses on climate change and health. Today, I'll be sharing with you my experiences as a practitioner, as a physician, as a health uh, advocate to some extent, on um, the COP28 program. COP28 stands for the, um, I'll, I'll get to what it stands for and, and what it's about, but really to say it's the United Nations climate change negotiations. Um, and there's a role here for everyone. Do put your questions in, in the chat um, and we'll take it from there. So an outline of my presentation over the next 40, 50 minutes. Firstly, what are the health impacts of climate change? Why should folks like you and I, whether you're a trainee in public health medicine or a fellow, uh, why should we care about this? Um, so really what I'm describing here is the new era of environmental hazards that bring together health protection, health promotion, disease prevention. Really the basic functions of what a public health practitioner does um, now have to adapt to this new era of climate change. The second thing I'll go through is the personal experience I had of being uh, part of the COP28 presidency, um, which is essentially the annual function given to a particular country um, in leading the climate change negotiations for that year or year and a half. Um, and I was a member of the health program within the COP28 presidency. It might help uh, trainees as well to understand what the international climate negotiation landscape looks like um, and different ways to contribute there. That's the final part of this session as well, to really think about some practical ways that we can be involved. So um, it's an exciting piece of work, really, and um, I'll just get straight to it. This is what my job looked like uh, indirectly, perhaps not the front line of the climate change response in the 2019-20 summer bushfires across the east coast of Australia, uh, but rather perhaps the final line of defence, if you like. Um, my role was in the environmental health branch of the New South Wales Ministry of Health. And we were responding to these bushfires together with our local public health units across different regions in New South Wales. And these were described as apocalyptic scenes for many uh, around the world um, and indeed in Australia. So the point of this image is climate change is not some Re some alternate reality or something that others need to deal with. This is very much a health protection issue. We had traditional environmental hazards such as air pollution, um, direct impacts from the fire itself. You can see loss to livelihood, loss to homes. Um, and there's an iconic kangaroo in the front, which demonstrates the loss to our biodiversity, flora and fauna. Um, and again, that's not a nebulous thing. There are clear links now between the ecosystem services that the planet provides for health, uh, which creates good health, or indeed in, in this case, is deleterious to health. So I think many of us know about this. Um, and just to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about later in this program, going all the way from the lived reality for us as practitioners, for us as individual citizens, all the way to where, how can we influence this process of mitigating, i.e. preventing climate change uh, and adapting to the health impacts of climate change like we saw in the last slide, all the way up to this international level. Um, just quickly to orient you to what's going on in these three images, um, I took these while I was at Dubai uh, in November, December last year, um, alongside, I should say, a number of other public health physicians and, and health practitioners from Australia. Um, but, but this is what the environment looks like. A large expo centre, you see on the left-hand side this image of um, a large building where the key outcomes of the two weeks of climate negotiations were being put up on large banners. Uh, you see something here around the COP28 UA Declaration on Climate and Health. Um, I was part of the team that helped write this. Uh, it was endorsed at that point by 129 countries. This is the day after Health Day, one of the days in the two weeks of negotiations. Um, that number is now closer to 140 countries. Um, and then you see some other you know, banners displaying the work. 
one on the top right hand side you see this uh, image of an auditorium where I presented on one of the presidency's key events for Health Day, which was around um, what are some of the solutions. So we had a solution showcase uh, for climate and health. Believe it or not, we still have to make the argument quite strongly that health needs to be at the centre of climate negotiations, indeed climate change activity locally for us in Australia and elsewhere. Um, and this was a wonderful opportunity to do that at the international stage. Um, and at the bottom right, you see a family photo. Um, and this is how things get done in international diplomacy. Uh, basically, you see a number of heads of states. You see um, Australia's health assistant health minister in red on, on the left-hand side of that image. Um, and you see some other key leaders from World Health Organization and really all countries, global north, global south. Um, so it was a big moment for health. Um, and I think we can well and truly say that health is now the centre um, of climate change negotiations going forward. Let's think briefly about what the health impacts of climate change are, um, starting from a fairly high level understanding, but we'll get uh, sophisticated quite quickly here in the next few slides. We know that increasing levels of carbon dioxide and other climate pollutants, greenhouse gases, uh, cause rises in temperature around the world. This has impacts on meteorological systems, rising sea levels, and extreme weather events. And the key point here is that uh, Rockstrom and colleagues from the Stockholm Resilience Centre some years ago described this as zigzag non-linear changes. So for the longest time of human civilization or, or human habitation on this planet, a lot of these geological, meteorological earth systems have been somewhat predictable. Um, but now the point is with climate change, a lot of those predicted weather patterns have changed, are changing, and will continue to change in unpredictable ways. So that's the zigzag and the non-linear change. For us in health, we probably care about what's at the bottom of this image. Um, some of the exposure pathways, as we say in environmental health practice, uh, around exposure pathways to causing disease, morbidity, mortality. So we have things ranging from direct impacts, extreme weather events that have that cause trauma and injuries to health, heat stress, air pollution, water quality and quantity. That's quite important. We'll come to that on the next slide. Um, as well as food supply, food safety, food security, vector distribution with mosquito-borne diseases, um, and most importantly, perhaps equally importantly, but really important for uh, from a public health physician, uh, social determinants perspective, some of the social factors that mediate um, worsening impacts from everything else that's listed here. That mediation is also captured here in the central box in this image around the demographic, socioeconomic, environmental and other factors um, that, that basically magnify the health impacts from climate change. So what are those exposure pathways and what are some of the health outcomes? Well, they're described here. Um, and if we take the central one, water quality and quantity as an example, Depending on where you live on this planet, water quality may be an issue. We often feel we have excellent uh, water sanitation and hygiene practices in Australia. We're probably not wrong for the majority of the population. Uh, but if you talk to our colleagues who work in health protection in regional and rural areas, we might have areas that are not fluoridated adequately. We might have water systems that have ongoing, and this is a present day concern, um, issues with water quality um, as well as the water amenity. So we're talking about water that doesn't look clear. Of course, that's on a more apparent point of view, but also at a microbial level, we have increases in the likelihood of diseases such as Campylobacter infection, cholera, uh, leptospirosis. So water quality is clearly an issue where public health practitioners have a role. Indeed, all health practitioners have a role in, in preventing and, and treating waterborne diseases. But let's talk about water quantity as well, because in other parts of the world, and again, this comes to our shores in Australia with extreme weather events such as the flooding that we experienced on the East Coast in the last two years, um, water quality, quantity itself becomes a problem. And that is obviously the case in other parts of the world, particularly less well-resourced countries, and importantly, less well-resourced health systems. So imagine we have an existing load in terms of burden of disease in Australia. Imagine how much worse it gets with 
any of these conditions uh, which are amplified due to climate change. Since we're talking about what happens around the world, um, I think this point is critical, that climate change has built-in health inequities. Let's just reflect on this slide for a minute or two. Uh, this is what's known as a cartogram. Uh, basically, the units here are countries, and the units are larger or smaller in the display of the map based on what you're measuring. So in the top map, uh, you see cumulative emissions of greenhouse gases uh, by each country. So you can see Europe is rather large, so is the USA, um, but some countries are quite small, uh, Latin America, Africa. Japan is quite large as well on the right-hand side. On the bottom map, you see the estimates of per capita mortality due to climate change. These are estimates from World Health Organization in the paper that's quoted at the bottom of the slide. And you can see where the health impacts of climate change are felt most, Africa, Southeast Asia, but quite less so in North America, Europe, Australia. Important point to make, this is a paper from 2007 using data from more than 20 years ago. This image would look a bit different now, but the point remains that health inequities are very much built into uh, climate change. And that affects how the climate negotiations go. Um, some of you might have heard of the loss and damage fund, which we'll come to shortly in this presentation, but essentially it talks about how we as a global community address um, the historical impacts due to some parts of the world, typically the global north, um, who have benefited from the emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to spur on their development, um, to reach really high levels of livelihood, economic gain, but also health standards. Comparing that against parts of the world which have not contributed quite as much to climate change, how does that get recompensed and addressed? I quite like this image from the National Institutes of Health in the USA because it talks about not only the health impacts, which we've talked about in the last couple of slides, you see these on the left three boxes, but also on the right-hand side, the interventions and strategies. Um, what can we do when you go to work? What systems can you develop? What um, epidemiological methods can you use? So here, here's some examples, and, and we can talk about these further. The one intervention and strategy that's relevant in any health system, whether you're at a public health unit locally, whether you're in a health service provider, whether you're a hospital clinician, um, you probably want early warning and preparedness to be filtered down to you in a timely manner. And for those of us who work in uh, departs, departments of health, um, that is one of the roles, to interface with the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, to interface with um, the Department of Environment, which often holds is the data custodian for things like air pollution data. So, Early warning, preparedness, emergency management are core func functions to what a public health physician does. Disease prevention plans, um, clearly that's another function, um, but these often now have to be adapted in order to cope with the additional burden due to climate change. Um, other functions like community engagement, education awareness raising, and integration across health programs is the next frontier in many ways, uh, which is not to say this doesn't happen now, it does. Uh, but now we have to apply a climate change lens over the top of our existing strategies and interventions in addressing the health impacts of climate change. My last slide on this section is around just bringing us back to that fundamental um, social determinants approach that we apply in public health. There's two models for this. I mean, it's the same model here. Uh, many will have seen on the left-hand side the Dahlgren and Whitehead model, uh, which talks about the individual in the context of their lifestyle factors, in the context of their community and social environment, and then housing, education, work, employment, um, and some of the other access to healthcare and, and safe water uh, and, and good food and nutrition. We know about this, that the general socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions affect health. Barton and Grant, however, had a slightly expanded model. So they go beyond that semicircle to almost a full circle. Um, and I quite like this because at the very top of this model or at the very extent of this model, it talks about the global ecosystem. So taking it all the way from the individual 
through to their lifestyle factors, the local economy in, this, in, in which they operate and the commercial determinants of health, all the way out to the natural environment, the built environment, the activities, meaning how we interact with our physical environment, but then also the global ecosystem at the very top, climate change and biodiversity, which, by the way, both have their own framework convention from the United Nations to address these big upstream determinants of health. So I hope I can encourage you to use the right-hand side uh, expanded model of social determinants because others will, some people will describe this as the eco-social determinants. Um, really, it all boils down to this, you know, how are we structuring our societies locally as well as globally um, in order to have more health-promoting approaches that are upstream of where we are and where we have control over our health. All right, a bit about COP28 and UNFCCC, um, and I will encourage you to put your questions in the chat. Um, there's, there's time for that, certainly, in this presentation. So let, let's disentangle some of these acronyms, this, this word soup. Um, COP28 stands for the Conference of Parties. In other words, the countries that have signed up to uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, uh, which is this international process of negotiating around how we as an international community will address this existential threat. It's an existential threat not only to health, right? It's So if you look at the COP28 health program, for example, or rather the general program of the two weeks of negotiations, you'll see different days devoted to different themes. There was a theme for um, engineering related solutions. So energy provision, for example, there was a day or a theme devoted to health. There was a day or a theme devoted to First Nations issues and so on. So let's just remember that health is framed along many other sectors of the economy. And it's important for us to be having that voice up front to say, it took 28 years, right? So it took 28 years until, and, and a lot of advocacy from colleagues across the health systems, across advocacy, practice, academia, uh, to bring us to this point. So this, therefore, many will describe COP28 as a, you know, a milestone moment for the health sector because we finally had a seat at the table, so to speak, uh, with the first ever health day uh, devoted to health issues at a COP. Which is not, again, to say that, it wasn't discussed before, it was, um, but this was a real success moment for three reasons. I'll come to those three reasons in two slides time, but I just want to show you, or rather give you an insight into the process. So COP28 is an annual or 1.5 year process. So there's a year of programming, um, which in this case, we started with a formal letter in July. Um, it started a little bit before that, but in July, the president of um, the COP28 process wrote a letter to the parties saying, this is the approach they're proposing, the strategy and the plan. And it culminated in November, December, uh, those two weeks where uh, negotiations were held in Dubai. Uh, it was quite a large COP this year um, with some 70 or 80,000 delegates from around the world um, who attended which itself has a whole commentary and critique around it, around the size, around the purpose and the function. But we won't dwell on that too much. Just to give you a sense that this, this was the time of the first global stock take of the Paris Agreement, uh, which happened in 2015. It was one of the earlier COPs. And at that time, uh, the 1.5 degree uh, or two degree goal was set to limit global warming uh, from pre-industrial levels to that number, 1.5 degrees. How would What was the strategy? So the strategy here is outlined in these four boxes, um, fast-tracking the energy transition and reducing greenhouse gas emissions before 2030. Not at all far away. That's very close. Um, so how do you do that? Well, you can triple the number of renewables around the world, as it says here. Um, you can decarbonize the energy system by making net zero commitments towards most in most countries, 2050 which is quite a far way away and almost out of sight. I hope not out of mind. A couple of other components of what the plan was intending to do, um, using major funding mechanisms. So as it describes here, a new deal on financing. So making sure that things like the loss and damage fund, L&D fund here, as it's described, gets set up um, and that they have enough money in them. Um, there's other funds that are mentioned here, uh, such as the GCF, 
Um, there's also something called the GEF, basically climate and environmental funding bodies um, to provide projects and programs of work in countries where they're needed. A couple of other key things that happen, which uh, perhaps we don't have time to dwell on here, is um, adopting a framework for the global goal on adaptation and really making the point here that there's two sides to the coin when it comes to climate change. One side is mitigation, i.e. reducing the number of greenhouse gases that we emit into the atmosphere through human activity. And the other side is adaptation. So if you want to use a pithy term for this, uh, mitigation is about avoiding the unmanageable and adaptation is the other way around, um, managing the unavoidable. Basically, we'll have to adapt to certain impacts of climate change that are locked in. So very relevant to our practice today as health practitioners and certainly more so into the future. This is truly existential stuff because the systems we have now are more or less not designed to cope with that future state uh, that we'll find ourselves in. Finally, on the right-hand side, there was a lot of work done um, around mobilizing for the most inclusive COP ever, um, if, if you believe the branding here. And look, my personal reflection was there was a lot of um, visibility of Indigenous organizations, First Nations people. Um, perhaps not as much as I would have expected, but again, there's almost two sides to the climate negotiations process. There's what people do in the room, the actual negotiators who are from country governments, and what happens outside that process uh, or in parallel to that process, which is where folks like myself um, and others get to put forward the key issues for their sector. So we put forward the key issues for the health sector. We attended a number of First Nations events where our colleagues, often health colleagues, were putting forward the key issues in terms of uh, their constituents. So I hope this gives you somewhat of an overview of what the COP28 process is about. Um, for the health, now, now we're drilling down a bit. So for the health sector, um, we aim to be a watershed moment, right? Um, I think the challenge on the left-hand side uh, I've outlined, but uh, the ambition was really around two key things, which you see on the right-hand side. Um, one is around lifting the political profile of the climate and health agenda. Um, as I mentioned, the first ever health day, and we aim to do those three key things, which I'll come to on the next slide. But one of them is mentioned here, the first ever climate health ministerial and a declaration that at least the health ministers of every country um, agree that this is a key priority for them, which leads on to other things. And that's outlined here as the second item around unlocking finance. So a, a set of common principles for climate health financing around the world uh, were put forward um, and, and these were adopted by some 40 plus organizations, more so on the funding side of things, right? So multilateral donor banks, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and so forth, and some of the major philanthropies like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and so forth. So let's get to some of the things we did um, through the health sector at the UN climate negotiations process. As I mentioned, we had a declaration and, and I've provided hyperlinks here for folks that are interested um, to follow this up. Um, at the time I wrote this, there were 143 countries that had um, endorsed this declaration. And it just spells out the fact that there's commitment for addressing this issue from health systems around the world. The guiding principles, as I mentioned, were backed by a number of organizations, but also in the same process, a billion dollars was committed for climate and health work. And if you're reading the words here really carefully on the screen, uh, what does climate and health work mean? Um, and why have I used that word work rather than a, a new program or a UN agency established for this purpose? Well, agencies for this exist. Um, and they are bilateral. So for example, Australia through DFAT or the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has bilateral arrangements. We uh, DFAT sends Australian health practitioners to support countries in the Indo-Pacific region, particularly. There's also multi multilateral processes, such as the World Health Organization, which has a country office essentially in almost every country of the world um, and provides technical guidance and support. So that's the sort of work we're talking about. But unfortunately, as I referenced earlier, for many people outside the health sector, the relevance of including health in climate planning is not as clear as it should be. 
perhaps others may, those not in the health sector would think of um, the need to decarbonize the energy grid. So they might say, well, let's focus all of our funding and effort on putting renewables up. Now, certainly that will have benefits to health, but at the same time, we have to remember health services use a lot of energy and therefore have their own carbon footprint that needs to be reduced. But also health systems are very much affected by the increasing morbidity, mortality due to the health, health impacts of climate change. So therefore, the health sector really needs to receive a lot of that funding um, in order to provide an anchor function in any society. So this is the, the sort of narrative that we built up. Um, that narrative was expressed through this COP28 prospectus of climate and health solutions. So really setting out the health argument, providing a framework for action, um, and importantly, setting out the evidence-based or some evidence-based case studies on interventions that can be rapidly scaled up around the world. As I mentioned at the very beginning, um, I had the privilege of hosting a solution showcase event. Um, it was quite amazing um, in typical UAE fashion, uh, the United Arab Emirates, um, everything was um, bigger and better uh, and on a grand scale. So we had this auditorium um, attended by 150 delegates featuring a number of eminent speakers, you know, including a Nobel laureate and heads of the Adaptation Fund, for example, you know, agencies that would be putting their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and funding a lot of this work, getting engaged in this work. Um, so we had this prospectus document and then we had a solution showcase which um, highlighted some of those case studies. And importantly for us, I think, um, for a lot of us, COP28 also saw the launch of the Australian National Health and Climate Strategy. Very exciting. Um, the first time ever that Australia has put forward its national vision through the Department of Health on what climate and health um, looks like for us across states and territories and non-government organisations and everything else. So that's an important point, which I think the conversation has really only started because that strategy had been built up over the last year or two. Um, and again, another milestone moment where we presented this, um, I shouldn't say we, I should say the Department of Health presented this um, at the Australian Pavilion in Dubai. Just to give you a sense of the prospectus document and the framework we used, again, as I mentioned, the purpose here was to set the narrative really clearly. So why should the health sector receive funding from climate change uh, processes, but also what does the health sector um, add to this process and what does it provide? So firstly, addressing the health impacts of climate change is a critical function for health, and that's around addressing the burden of disease. Then strengthening the resilience and environmental sustainability of health systems and facilities, addressing both sides of that coin that I mentioned, adaptation and mitigation of climate change through health activities. And then finally, um, promoting actions, so health promoting actions that reduce carbon emissions and improve health, sometimes known as the health co-benefits. So all of the, the other sectors that might think their area is important, no doubt it is in addressing climate change. That work, when health is integrated into that, um, can produce these co-benefits to health as well as the other sector and reduce climate change impacts. A couple of slides now just to show you some of those outputs. Um, there are QR codes, so you can um, take a snap of this on your phone. Um, and of course, there's links available after this, uh, this presentation. But um, the World Health Organization had a web page devoted to this, uh, what the health sector, um, really universities, health departments, um, individual health advocates and other non-government associations, organizations, they were coming to the fore at this. Um, you know, two-week event. So you can see on the right-hand side at the bottom, um, there's a number of events that were listed. And even just looking at those would give you a sense of um, who's doing what around climate change. And it's expanding. It's, it's quite an exciting time in that way. Everyone's got a unique, local, uh, you know, contextually dependent solution and they need to be shared. Here's, here's another key output from the COP28 health program, which I was a part of, um, the prospectus document that I referenced, you know, talking about these three key areas, adaptation and mitigation um, and health impacts. Again, this is available online as well. But I think on our minds would be the question of 
this is great, you know, um, high level events. It's a lot of networking. It's a lot of getting to know what other people are doing, critical to helping us doing our own work locally. But what's our role in all of this? Because I think some might argue, well, I have a day job. It's something else, right? I work in a particular area. So what can I do practically? The reason I've gone to this somewhat complicated slide to answer that question, and I won't dwell on this, is just to say, if we take a framing that's around the basic building blocks of health systems, this wheel on the left-hand side, there's a role for all of us in this. You know, Let's say you're a, an academic, so that green set of three building blocks around the health information systems. Well, climate and health research could be your job. You can integrate the climate impacts in your work. Okay, what if you're a health educator? Well, that red uh, colored health workforce area around capacity building could be your work. What if I'm a senior public health physician or CEO of a health organization? What could I do? Well, the very first uh, purple colored 12 o'clock position uh, building block is around leadership and governance. Our health systems will look remarkably different in five years time, 10 years time, 50 years time. So how are we gonna start preparing them? If you're a chief finance officer, the color yellow here, sustainable climate financing for health, that will be a big concern. So if we're not dealing with these things right now, it will be very much a problem into the future. It is a problem now. Okay, some other, some other practical things. If you're really interested, I would strongly encourage you to have a look at the National Climate and Health Strategy. Um, it has these four objectives, right? And these are very much mired in the public health way of thinking. This is critical. Uh, let's move straight to objective four, health in all policies. That's a long-standing approach where we put health at the center of things. Well, that's, that's, that's a fundamental requirement of this strategy. So you can help in delivering that. Um, the other objectives around health system resilience, health system decarbonization, international collaboration, and there's 50 actions that underpin this strategy. I mean, I think it's fair to say the Department of Health cannot achieve this strategy without engagement and input from people like us. So this is a critical time to get involved, and it won't stop here with this strategy. It's five years in duration, um, and this work will filter down into any state and territory jurisdiction, indeed, any health organisation where you work. What else can you do? Well, um, I, I like this image. This was sent around during COP28 because um, there's, so, so engage with the research. That's the message on this slide. The message on the last slide was engage with the policy process. There's something known as the MJA Lancet Countdown. The Medical Journal of Australia, together with the Lancet Journal in the UK, came together um, to produce this so-called Countdown to 2030. The Countdown to 2030 is around tracking progress on climate and health indicators. Now, this is exactly what governments use or should use in order to make their decisions around policy setting. This can also be made granular with a bit of engagement with our research colleagues um, and applied to your own organisation. Fun fact, there's three rows of people, Lancet Countdown authors and contributors. An entire row here could be occupied by the Australian delegates from the Lancet Countdown family of authors uh, at COP28. So, you know, in typical fashion, Australia on an international stage often punches above its weight. Just a slight amusement there for you. Um, what else can we do? Well, there's... Networks now in Australia that try to integrate both of those last two slides, integrating policy practice and the research outputs. So making sure that research is very much implementable. And here I'm highlighting the HEAL network where I work, uh, Healthy Environments and Lives, underpinned by the first NHMRC or rather the largest NHMRC grant for climate change and health in Australia. Now, the idea is to bring together policy and decision makers many of whom are on this Zoom call, together with data providers, some of you may work at the AIHW, um, together with organisations, uh, you know, Aboriginal community control organisations, for example, um, and other health sector organisations that are advocates or um, education providers, for example, the Royal College of Physicians, um, Doctors for the Environment and so forth. 
Climate and Health Alliance. There's too many to name, but really the idea is to bring together these four different areas um, where sometimes we divide ourselves into silos. It's a large organization or rather a large network um, and includes some hundred chief investigators across 30 different uh, institutions and so forth. My final slide is this. This slide was put out during the COVID pandemic. Um, and I thought it resonated really well with someone like me, or I hope many of you, where our training is around thinking about the upstream determinants of health. So you see a stream here with three waves uh, causing damage to health. Um, and sometimes it does feel, does it not, that we're here on the left-hand side in our communities, close to communities, in our role as public health physicians, um, with our fairly simple message um, when we're in front of the media or when we're advising someone about an outbreak investigation on the phone. And this is critical. I mean, this, this, this is health messaging and wielding an entire health service to prevent a pandemic is laudable and necessary and uh, it ensures that society remains functioning. And we did that, I think, by and large. We can say we, we did that very successfully as a health sector in Australia. We address that first wave of COVID-19. I mean, all the waves of COVID-19, the wave number one de depicted here. But I think it was very clear, even in the pandemic response, that the second wave that's described here is the impacts from the economy, in this case, described as recession. But we knew that by taking certain actions to address COVID, there were impacts on the economy, people's livelihoods, movements, social harmonization. But then if we keep following that logic all the way upstream, what else is coming? I mean, uh, recognising that climate change and let's frame it differently, the environment, the planetary systems, the planetary health, basically, on which we depend in order to do anything downstream. If we're disrupting that, if that is getting impacted in a way that, by the way, impacted by human activity in the Anthropocene, this era that we find ourselves in, if we're addressing, if we're not addressing, those upstream impacts that we're creating, some of our work at the bottom of the hill will be more difficult to do. Maybe all of it will be impossible to do in worst case scenarios. Another concept to leave you with is, in a way, this image describes the so-called triple bottom line of sustainable development. We talk about the social impacts, let's say the COVID-19 pink wave here. Uh, we describe the financial impacts, so the recession blue wave here, and we think about the environmental impacts, in, in this case, climate change in green. So the triple bottom line says, when you're thinking about managing an organisation, whether it's in health or any other sector, uh, think about not just the financial bottom line, but also the environmental bottom line and the social bottom line. Um, for us in the health sector, the social bottom line is really clear, it's health. Um, and we are often custodians of organisations and teams and budgets. So we think about the financial bottom line, but if we neglect um, or feel pressured to focus on things other than or forget about the environment, um, we're missing something. So I'll end on that slide um, and I will stop sharing. Uh, if there are questions, um, please do uh, put them through in the chat. Uh, otherwise, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much uh, for your attention on this important topic.